Good morning. And peace be with you. I want to welcome us to worship at Granby Congregational Church. If this is your first time visiting us, and I know that we have a number of first time visitors in our midst this morning, we are delighted that you are here and we want you to know that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. In the pews, there's an, a few different ways you can get connected with the church. If you, uh, you'd like to connect with us online or through our newsletter, reach out to me. There's a newcomer visitor card that you can fill out. And there are uh, bowls in the front and back of the sanctuary that you can place those in following worship. That is also the place where you can make a financial contribution or um, your pledge in that same place after worship if you would like to support the ongoing ministries of this congregation. And if you have a prayer request that you would like to share in worship this morning or pass on to our prayer change, there are prayer cards in the pews and the deacons will be collecting those during the passing of the peace. Does anyone have any announcements they'd like to make this morning? Well, it's not quite worship if we don't have announcements, so I'll come to the announcement podium and make one. This is a reminder that on July 7th, the first Sunday in July, we will be moving to the North Campus for worship, and our summer worship time is at 9 a.m. So. An hour early, a little bit north, two changes in one, we got this. And you know what, I'll zip over at 10 a.m. just in case anyone forgets <laughs> that first Sunday. But July 7th, we'll be shifting campuses. So this morning, I am honored and thrilled to welcome Reverend Marilyn Kendricks, uh, our guest preacher this morning. Three years ago, Reverend Kendricks retired from the Southern New England Conference leadership as one of our conference ministers. And what I have learned in Granby is that retirement does not mean an ending to our vocations. Oftentimes, our retired folks are the busiest because they are busy living out their purpose and passions in the world. And Reverend Kendricks has done this with her social justice preaching ministry, visiting over 90 different congregations in our region, bringing a message of good news, um, theology and spirituality on systemic racism, which is, as always, is an important and timely issue. For our congregation especially, we have begun exploring a potential partnership and membership with the Greater Hartford Interfaith Action Alliance. And so we are discerning how we might feel called to engage in that work in Hartford County to uproot systemic racism in our institutions to join with our interfaith partners in the region. So this is timely and I want to welcome and thank Reverend Kendricks for being here this morning. After worship, we will B, there's an opportunity um, for a sermon talkback, which is a, a very generous offer when you're in a congregation for the first time. So the two of us will be in the parlor, and I want to invite you to um, you know, stop at coffee hour, grab some coffee and food, and then come and join us to continue the conversation, to unpack and learn more of what we heard in today's worship service, and just continue to be in dialogue with one another. So with that, let us prepare our hearts and minds as we enter into a time of worship.
Good morning. Good morning. Please join me in the responsive call to worship. Tender God, though your heart breaks, you do not lose hope. Angry God, the degradation of people, creatures, and places makes you rage. But you do not say all is lost. You invite us to your work of waymaking. We are called to practice generosity, cultivate abundance, engage in healing. Let us worship God through our stubborn resilience and joy. Please join us um, by standing in spirit or body and um, for our first hymn. You may be seated. Let us unite our voices for our morning prayer. O oh God, creator of heaven and earth, who grants us life, may the seeds of wisdom from the ancient sacred texts grow within us so that we may bear good fruit that nourishes a hungry world. May the Holy Spirit of Pentecost depend upon us this day 
as we give thanks to you, O Holy One. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May we embody God's love by saying to one another, Peace be with you. Let us welcome one another with words of peace. In preparation for Reverend Kendrick's visit today, I spent some time reading her work. I was particularly moved by a piece that she wrote back in 2020 about empathy. Empathy is a gift, and to have real empathy for all people, not just for whom you can relate to, is truly remarkable. I, myself, strive to have empathy and compassion for all. Reverend Kendricks, I fully agree with you with what you wrote. It is impossible to be a true disciple of Jesus without empathy. With so much chaos in our world, so many people disagreeing and fighting, it's important to be empathic, empathetic. It's vital as followers of Jesus that we lead with example, hold space for others and love others even if we do not understand their challenges. I'd like to invite you all to put your hands on your heart and take three deep breaths with me. I'd like to share with you a short poem titled Empathy by a writer named Morgan Harper Nichols. Empathy. Let me hold the door for you. I may have never walked in your shoes, but I can see your souls are worn. Your strength is torn under the weight of a story that I have never lived before. Let me hold the door for you. After all you've walked through, it's the least I can do.
I don't know quite how to follow that. <laughs> that was beautiful. Thank you. Will you please join us for the prayer of illumination? Spirit of the living God, turn on the light of truth and wake up our hearts by the word we now declare and ponder. Our scripture today comes from Mark chapter 4, verses 26 through 34. He also said, the kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day and the seed would sprout and grow and he does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come. 
He also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which, when sown upon the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs, and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. Good morning, church. It is so good to be here. Before I even get started, I have to say that Roger and Dan touched my heart this morning. I don't know about you, but I felt the spirit here with us this morning, so thank you so very much. Oh, it is so good to be here. I thank you and Pastor Liz for having me in your pulpit this morning. It brings me great joy to be able to um, go around the conference and preach in various churches, and I have never been in Granby before. <laughs> so this is a real joy for me. I bring you greetings from Spring Glen Congregational Church in Hamden, Connecticut, where Alan and I, my husband and I, and our uh, two of our daughters, two of our children, and three of our grandchildren are, are members. Um, I think they sit on their sofa and still watch online, but that's okay. <laughs> oh, so will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. On this uh, coming Wednesday, we will ce celebrate Juneteenth, the newest federal holiday. It's been 158 years since the first Juneteenth was celebrated in 1866 by some of the black folks in Texas, but it took 156 years more for our nation to commemorate the end of slavery in America. So let me tell you a little bit about Juneteenth, which is a contraction of June 19th. It's a day to commemorate the day that we think of as the last enslaved people to hear about their freedom, their emancipation at the end of the Civil War. News did not always get to faraway reaches of the nation very quickly, and the enslaved folks in Galveston, Texas, didn't hear about the end of slavery until June 19th, 1865, almost two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation made enslaved folks free in the states that were in rebellion. It's uh, on January 1st, 1863, and Texas was one of those states and it's a little over four months after the passage of the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, outlawing slavery everywhere in America on Jan January 31st, 1865. And it's a little over two months after the surrender of Confederate General Robert E. Lee to Union General Ulysses Grant that ended the Civil War in April of 1865. The folks down in Galveston had not heard that they were free until Union Army General Gordon Granger read the Emancipation Proclamation to them. The following year, those folks celebrated Juneteenth for the first time to remember the Day of Jubilee, and some African American communities around the nation have been celebrating it ever since. Three years ago, on June 17, 2021, President Joe Biden signed the Juneteenth National Independence Day into law as a national holiday. 
You know, just recently I learned something else about Juneteenth that I didn't know already. Seems that enslavers in the Southeast had attempted to avoid emancipation by forcibly moving more than 150,000 enslaved black people to Texas between 1862 and 1865. So those who learned about their freedom on that first Juneteenth were not all Texans. <laughs> the other thing that is important to know, I think, is that all black people freed around the nation by either the Emancipation Proclamation of the 13th Amendment were set free with absolutely nothing. No money, no food, no home, no resources whatsoever. These folks and their predecessors had labored for centuries without compensation for their labor. They were crucial, crucial to the building of America, not only in the South, but right here in New England as well. The United States would never have become the economic powerhouse that it is today without centuries of free labor. But those folks freed that day and the days before got nothing. It should not be surprising that the legacy of over 250 years of slavery and the 100 years of Jim Crow segregation and subjugation lives on in the systems the racist systems that impact black people and other people of color still today. But, but let's turn to scripture. Enough history for now. In today's gospel reading, Jesus is in the middle of the teaching a large crowd and he is using parables to make some important points. These parables that Mark relates tell us about Jesus' ministry and his understanding of the gospel. The parable that we heard today is often called the parable of the mustard seed. The kingdom of God, says Jesus, is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all seeds of the earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs. As I read this short story by Jesus, I could hear his belief, his belief that we don't need a whole crowd of people or a bunch of resources to make a difference for good in this world. Just one of us, raising our voice, testifying to the truth, standing up for justice can make a difference. We can be the mustard seeds. But you know, if I have any complaint about us progressive Christians, it would be that we don't raise our voices nearly as loud as we should. There are people all over our nation who are calling themselves Christian, who seem to have forgotten the teachings of the head of the church, Jesus Christ. And there are other folks who believe that we should be beyond talking about racism in this country. But as long as it exists, we need to talk about it. Recently, I read an op-ed in the New York Times by David French that put it into context for me. He wrote this. One of the most important realities of American life is this. No nation can fully undo the effects of 345 years of state-sanctioned bigotry from slavery to Jim Crow in 59 years. The period between the arrival of the first slaves on colonial shores in 1619 and the abolition of legalized discrimination with the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is simply too long. The in discrimination too ingrained, the distortion of society too great to wave the wand of legal and cultural reform and quickly realize the dream of American equality. Close quote. So true. And so today we will talk about systemic racism and the hysteria over critical race theory. 
You know, today there are folks who are speaking untruths and spreading confusion about racism in general and CRT, critical race theory in particular. I think that the people who've taken the adjective woke, which was an American, African-American slang expression, which originally meant to be aware of the ways that racism has impacted some folks in America, which is a good thing to be aware of that. If we believe that those folks are also children of a loving God, but those other folks have taken the word woke and subverted it to separate groups of people into factions of fear and hate. In the words of the prophet Isaiah in the 58th chapter, the prophet tells the people to shout out, do not hold back, lift up your voices like a trumpet. Because Lord knows the people who are using scare tactics are very loud and we must raise our voices very high in order to be heard. Critical race theory. It has become this decade's racism rallying cry. After the outpouring of indignation around the nation, around the world, that the on-camera murder of George Floyd caused, after the determination of thousands of good folks to finally, finally address racism, systemic racism as it presents itself in our policing, there was the not unexpected backlash of hysteria over the teaching of CRT in public schools. Folks online and in some national news outlets began using CRT as the boogeyman to scare uninformed people into a retreat, yet again, from all attempts to put racism behind us. And what exactly is critical race theory? <laughs> I've heard folks who are beside themselves about the teaching of CRT who have no idea what it is. They don't know what they're talking about. So I'll take a moment to define CRT so that we are all on the same page. This is a quote from Stephen Sawchuck in Education Week magazine. He writes, and I quote, Critical race theory is an academic concept that is over 40 years old. The core idea is that race is a social construct and that racism is not merely the product of individual bias or prejudice, but something embedded in our society's systems and policies and practices." Close quote. Many white people up, are up in arms about the teaching of CRT in public schools, K through 12. They don't know that it's really not being taught in public schools. <laughs> what is being taught is history, perhaps a more fulsome, inclusive history than was taught when many of you and I were in school, but it is history nonetheless. And these folks say, well, they say that the children are made to feel bad ashamed of being white, or uncomfortable about learning that our founding fathers were human beings with all the biases that go along with being human, that they were indeed driven by high-minded ideas about democracy and self-government, but that they may also have been driven by the desire to hold on to wealth and power. These people who rail against the boogeyman CRT don't want children to learn these things. They don't want children to feel bad about their race. Now, there's only one thing missing from their assumptions about the children who might be taught about racism because in all of these discussions, when the children that are imagined feeling bad are mentioned, it's only from the point of view of the white kids, right? It's like the black kids, the children of color, who are also sitting in those classrooms, do not exist. They can't see them there. Their point of view does not matter. It's like they are invisible. And remember, no one should be invisible in the beloved community of Christ. Might the black children feel bad about their race 
if we leave out the reason behind the racism that they have experienced, most black kids by the time they're five years old, and that the reason does not point to something wrong within them, isn't the notion that somehow white children should be protected from ever feeling bad at the expense of black children being made to feel bad all the time and internalizing society's view of them? Isn't that just another form of white supremacy? I agree with black parents who say, if my child is old enough to experience racism, then white kids are old enough to learn about it. You know, I read a post recently on Facebook where a nine-year-old white girl was asked how she felt about reading the children's version of the 1619 Project. Now, in your bulletins today, there's a book list that I have provided um, because you can keep on learning even after I'm gone. <laughs> you can. And the 1619 Project is on that list. But she was asked about uh, reading the children's version of the 1619 Project in school that many parents are trying to ban from school curriculums. And this was her answer. She said, I think the only white people who feel bad or mad or uncomfortable about the stuff that white people did in history are the people who want to do it again. Close quote. Out of the mouths of babes, right? That's my hope for America, <laughs> the kids. <laughs> but you know, as I talked with and listened to lots of white people over these past few years, I've discovered that many don't even know what we mean when we say systemic racism. Not systematic racism. That would mean identified steps to achieve racism, right? Systematic. <laughs> That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about systemic racism, and it's racism that is in, so embedded in our culture's systems that it's like in the air we breathe and the water that we all drink. It's in the systems and practices and policies and even laws that appear to be race neutral on their face. So since so many folks seem a little confused about what I'm even talking about, I thought I'd provide a couple of examples. Example number one. Um, this is uh, an example that I recently read about in the New York Times. That rag. <laughs> Seems that last summer, Nathan Connolly, a professor at Johns Hopkins University and his wife, had their house in Baltimore reappraised in order to refinance their mortgage. Just like lots of us, they want to lower their costs, take advantage of low interest rates, right? And they believed that their house, improved with renovations of about $40,000, was worth much more than the $450,000 that they paid for it in 2017. After all, just like you and me, they have access to Zillow. <laughs> they could see what the neighbors' houses were being valued at. But a Maryland appraisal company put the home's value at $472,000. So they chose not to refinance at that time. Months later, after that first appraisal, the couple applied for another refinance loan with another company, but this time they got a little bit more creative. They removed all of their family photos. They took down all of their children's uh, drawings of figures with dark skin. They took down their Black Panther poster removed the literature by black authors, anything that would signal that this house belonged to black people. And then they had a white male colleague, another professor from Johns Hopkins, to stand in for them during the appraisal. And the second appraisal was valued at, well, you tell me, what do you think? 500. 525. 550. Did I hear a 600? <laughs> 700. That's, it was, a, it was appraised at $750,000. Does that blow your mind or what? Right? 
Yes. <laughs> oh, man. This comes from a journal article on health disparities by Paula Braveman, um, because I thought it might be helpful to provide a definition of systemic racism. And so this is what they write. Systemic and structural racism are forms of racism that are pervasively and deeply embedded in systems, laws, written and unwritten policies, and entrenched practices and beliefs that produce, condone, and perpetuate widespread unfair treatment and oppression of people of color with adverse consequences." Close quote. So our appraisal example shows racism baked into the systems that appraisers are using today. You know, race of the people. <laughs> Click. It's white supremacy baked in. In her book, also on your list, Heather McGee, he, she wrote a book called The Sum of Us, S-U-M, The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together. She estimates that there is $68 billion in lost wealth for black homeowners because of this example of systemic racism that results in white supremacy. You know, these systems and structures are so intertwined that systemic racism just continues without any actual card-carrying racists fueling it. You know, most folks, folks like you and me, we have most of our wealth in the houses that we own, in the property that we own. And that creates the opportunity to have intergenerational wealth, wealth that has lifted so many of us into the middle class and beyond. But on average, the a median annual income of white Americans is almost eight times higher than the median annual income of black Americans. And there are lots and lots of reasons, many of them caused by systemic racism, that explain this ridiculous disparity. So let me share you another example of systemic racism that pro provides just one small contribution to this disparity. Let's take a look at black farmers. There are black farmers. <laughs> the United States Department of Agriculture has been doing injustice for decades to black people who want to farm. Data shows that black farmers have been denied loans from the Department of Agriculture at a rate twice as high as white farmers. And if you know anything about farming, you know that uh, getting a loan is absolutely essential to planting your fields. Due to this ongoing systemic racism, black farmers in the United States have lost about $326 billion worth of farmland during the 20th century, according to the first study to quantify that loss. And that land loss was due to discriminatory lending practices of the Department of Agriculture of the United States of America and forced sales of those black farmers' land. Systemic racism. You know, the infuriating thing about knowing this stuff is that when anyone tries to fix it, folks will yell, reverse discrimination. <laughs> the Biden administration tried to make loans to black farmers who had been the victims of systemic racism all these decades, but they had to pull back because of all the white farmers complaining essentially complaining that they were no longer benefiting from the unfairness of the system. It's only in knowing this stuff that we can hope to do anything about it. In order to lift our voices about the truth of systemic racism, we have to know about it, right? <laughs> Here's another example, my last one, I promise. Um, I just heard this on uh, Sunday morning a Sunday morning on NPR a few months ago, seems that uh, in sugarcane fields in Florida, part of the harvesting process includes burning the fields to get rid of the outer straw around the inner cane. Now, in Brazil, where most of the world's sugar comes from, they no longer burn the fields because of the air pollution that the burning produces. 
and the health risks to the people in the area. Seems like they care for those people. <laughs> they have developed another way to harvest sugarcane that does not include burning. But in Florida, the sugarcane companies continue to burn, and most of the resulting smoke blows over <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> blows over communities in the glades that are filled with mostly black and brown people. There's even a ban. There is even a ban on burning when the wind changes direction and it blows eastward toward wealthier, whiter communities like West Palm Beach. Cane burning is banned if it will make wealthy white people sick, <laughs> but it is deemed perfectly fine when blowing over communities of color where the incidences of various lung diseases affects almost every family. Systemic racism. I bet those sugarcane executives in Florida would not think of themselves as racist, but their disdain for poorer, blacker Americans results in racism, right? You now here of late, the controversy over critical race theory and the application of the word woke to anything you don't like <laughs> has become somewhat passe. The newest attack on people of color is the denigration of DEI programs, diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. DEI may be something else that you've heard about but are not real sure what it refers to. So again, let me provide a definition. This comes from an article in a recent issue of the New Yorker magazine by Kianga Yamada Taylor. She writes, DEI programming includes webinars, sensitivity trainings, reading groups, and speaker series, which are meant to address everything from workplace racism to legacies of industry inequality and the wide disparities between black and white people in America. The latest campaign against on anti-racist programs is intended to cast aspersions, or at the very least doubt, upon the presence of any black person in a position or place they are deemed not to belong." Close quote. So my preaching all over the Southern New England Conference about systemic racism could be thought of as my own little DEI program. <laughs> you know? One small mustard seed. This past Monday's UCC daily devotional, written by my friend, the Reverend Kaji Duja, said that there's really only one sermon that we should all be preaching. And here it is. God loves you, no matter what. Now live your life and do something about it because no matter what, you can. <laughs> Talk about mustard seed advice. We can do something about it. We can live into this one life with love for all people that Jesus would have us love. And as we think about the people that Jesus would have us love, the list of people who are being oppressed is growing longer and longer to include more and more people. When I was a child, it was mostly black folks who were the oppressed in our nation. But today, the oppressed are not only black people, but also Asian people and Latinx people and Muslim people and Jewish people and gay people and trans people and immigrants, many of whom are running for their lives. All the people who represent the other who should be full members of the beloved community that Jesus welcomed into his circle of friends. I suggested at the start of the sermon that Jesus' parable about the mustard seed should inspire us, each one of us, to raise our voices at public meetings, to testify to the truth, to stand up for justice. I suggested that we can be the mustard seeds Jesus, the head of the church, 
said, this is my commandment to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Professor Cornell West of Union Theological Seminary in New York, he says this, justice, justice is what love looks like in public. It causes me to ask the all important question for Christians, what would you do if you loved them? It's up to us to be the mustard seed, to sow justice for all God's people. May it be so, Ashe and Amen. may be seated. As we open our hearts in this time of prayer, we're lifting up the joys and concerns in our congregation. We're continuing to pray for several folks as they recover from surgeries or medical procedures, including for Todd healing from a stroke from Ray and Kate and Vicki following successful surgeries. 
We're praying for a granddaughter, Lexi, for an upcoming surgery to remove a mass from her breast. We're praying for a friend, Todd, for upcoming medical tests, praying for good results. We're lifting up Heather's dad in prayer following hospitalization for a stroke. And we're praying for Heather's own upcoming medical tests. We're lifting, we're praying for a dear friend, Dick, Laura and Jerry's friend who's on his last days. We're praying for his daughter, Jody, at the end of this long road and lifting up joy that Jerry and Laura were able to be with him this week. For all these folks, we are praying for comfort and healing, for peace and love to surround them. We're also holding up this morning the Mounting family following the passing of Ken's mom. We're lifting up great love and honor for her transition and holding Ken's whole family in peace in this time of grief. Along with our concerns and our worries and our grief, we know that we also embody great joy and thanksgiving. So I want to lift up a prayer of thanksgiving for that powerful sermon that we heard this morning. Thank you, Reverend Kendricks. We're lifting up joy and safe travels for our Boy Scouts and adult leaders as they begin their two-week Philmont Wilderness Trek in New Mexico. And we're especially praying for Tom and Tommy as they enjoy, grow, and build amazing memories together. My college roommate worked at Philmont every summer, and every story I heard was the definition of amazing memory, so I'm excited for them. And we're lifting up prayers of joy this morning for Catherine Kibbe following a retirement of how many years of teaching in Granby was that? 31. 31 years. Awesome. We are holding you with joy and great hope for this time of transition as you enter into many new vocations and freedom in retirement, so. Are there other joys and concerns this morning that we want to lift up? I have a, a concern for a family friend, um, Allie, a teenager that's dealing with some um, digestive issues that she might get some answers um, for that. And then just um, gratitude, I don't know where they're sitting, for um, Dan and um, Roger for sharing their beautiful So prayers for Allie that she gets some answers for some digestion issues and then prayers of gratitude for Dan and Roger and that incredible gift they shared this morning. Others? So. Yeah, prayers of gratitude to all the fathers and those who have fathered us on this very happy Father's Day. <laughs> Let us continue in the spirit of prayer. Holy God, we are your mustard seed people, planting our faith, sowing our lives, modeled after Jesus. We have opened our hearts to you this morning, pouring out our worries, our hopes, our sorrows and our joy, pouring out just a few of the name of the people and places that are on our minds, whose lives we are wishing comfort and peace for, healing and hope. So God, hear our prayers, the ones said out loud, the ones that remain whispers on our hearts. Help us to feel your Holy Spirit moving amongst us 
in our homes and in the silence of the sanctuary. Let us continue in prayer using the words that Jesus taught his disciples, saying together, O Holy One, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And the us this day our daily prayer. And us, as we forgive our debtors, lead us not to temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our call to community is an invitation each week. We have come, we have worshiped, we have regrounded our lives in faith and heard a good word. And so now what? Where do we go from here? This morning, I want to invite us, we have a few ways we can carry forward the words that we have heard in this morning's worship service. There will be a conversation in the parlor after worship that all are invited to join me and Reverend Kendricks for. Perhaps on Juneteenth, you might pick up that biography and pick a book to continue your own learning or education around systemic racism. And then on Saturday, June 29th, I want to invite us to attend and participate in the Granby Unity Festival hosted by Granby Racial Reconciliation, the organization our congregation's been a strong supporter of and has many members who are engaged with. The Unity Festival um, will be similar to past Juneteenth festivals that we've had in town, celebrating the racial diversity in Granby, getting to know neighbors, and celebrating the fullness of our community with fantastic food and music and um, just a real spirit of joy. So that is on Saturday, June 29th. Our worship is not just once an hour a week, but it continues, that spirit of worship continues with us no matter where we go. So I'd invite us to join me in our prayer of commitment. Oh God, where hearts are fearful and constricted, grant courage and hope. Where anxiety is infectious and widening, grant peace and insurance. Where impossibilities close every door and window, grant imagination and resistance. Where distrust twists our thinking, grant healing and illumination. Where spirits are daunted and weakened, grant soaring wings and strengthen dreams. Amen. Let us rise once more as we sing, O oh, for a World.
And now hear this blessing from St. Francis of Assisi. <clears throat> May God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer pain, rejection, hunger, and war so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and turn their pain into joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in the world so that you can do what others cannot be, claim cannot be done to bring justice and kindness to all God's people. Go now to love and serve the Lord. Amen. <clears throat>